A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Third, The Track of a Storm. Chapter One, In Secret. The traveller fared slowly on his way, who fared towards Paris from England in the autumn of the year 1792. More than enough of bad roads, bad equipages, and bad horses, he would have encountered to delay him, though the fallen and unfortunate King of France had been upon his throne in all his glory. But the changed times were fraught with other obstacles than these. Every town-gate and village taxing-house had its band of citizen patriots, with their national muskets in a most explosive state of readiness, who stopped all comers and goers, cross-questioned them, inspected their papers, looked for their names in lists of their own, turned them back, or sent them on, or stopped them, and laid them in hold, as their capricious judgment or fancy deemed best for the dawning republic one and indivisible of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. A very few French leagues of his journey were accomplished, when Charles Darnay began to perceive that for him, along these country roads, there was no hope of return, until he should have been declared a good citizen at Paris. Whatever might befall now, he must on to his journey's end. Not a mean village closed upon him, not a common barrier dropped across the road behind him, but he knew it to be another iron door in the series that was barred between him and England. The universal watchfulness so encompassed him that if he had been taken in a net, or were being forwarded to his destination in a cage, he could not have felt his freedom more completely gone." This universal watchfulness not only stopped him on the highway twenty times in a stage, but retarded his progress twenty times in a day, by riding after him and taking him back, riding before him and stopping him by anticipation, riding with him and keeping him in charge. He had been days upon his journey in France alone, when he went to bed tired out in a little town on the high road, still a long way from Paris. Paris. Nothing but the production of the afflicted Gabelle's letter from his prison of the Abbey would have got him on so far. His difficulty at the guard-house in this small place had been such that he felt his journey to have come to a crisis, and he was, therefore, as little surprised as a man could be to find himself awakened at the small inn to which he had been remitted until morning in the middle of the night awakened by a timid local functionary and three armed patriots in rough red caps and with pipes in their mouths who sat down on the bed emigrant said the functionary i am going to send you on to paris under an escort citizen i desire nothing more than to get to paris though i could dispense with the escort "'Silence!' growled a red cap, striking at the coverlet with the butt-end of his musket. "'Peace, aristocrat!' "'It is as the good patriot says,' observed the timid functionary. "'You are an aristocrat, and must have an escort, and must pay for it.' "'I have no choice,' said Charles Darnay. "'Choice! Listen to him!' cried the same scowling red cap, as if it was not a favour to be protected from the lamp-iron. "'It is always as the good patriot says,' observed the functionary. "'Rise and dress yourself, emigrant.' Darnay complied, and was taken back to the guard-house, where other patriots in rough red caps were smoking, drinking, and sleeping by a watch-fire. Here he paid a heavy price for his escort, and hence he started with it on the wet, wet roads at three o'clock in the morning. The escort were two mounted patriots, in red caps and tricoloured cockades, armed with national muskets and sabres, who rode one on either side of him. 
The escorted governed his own horse, but a loose line was attached to his bridle, the end of which one of the patriots kept girded round his wrist. In this state they set forth, with the sharp rain driving in their faces, clattering at a heavy dragoon trot over the uneven town pavement and out upon the mire-deep roads." in this state they traversed without change except of horses and pace all the mire-deep leagues that lay between them and the capital they travelled in the night halting an hour or two after daybreak and lying by until the twilight fell the escort was so wretchedly clothed that they twisted straw round their bare legs and thatched their ragged shoulders to keep the wet off apart from the personal discomfort of being so attended and apart from such considerations of present danger as arose from one of the patriots being chronically drunk and carrying his musket very recklessly charles darnay did not allow the restraint that was laid upon him to awaken any serious fears in his breast for he reasoned with himself that it could have no reference to the merits of an individual case that was not yet stated, and of representations, confirmable by the prisoner in the abbey, that were not yet made. But when they came to the town of Beauvais, which they did at eventide, when the streets were filled with people, he could not conceal from himself that the aspect of affairs was very alarming an ominous crowd gathered to see him dismount of the posting-yard and many voices called out loudly down with the emigrant he stopped in the act of swinging himself out of his saddle and resuming it as his safest place said emigrant my friends do you not see me here in france of my own will you are a cursed emigrant cried a farrier, making at him in a furious manner through the press, hammer in hand, and you are a cursed aristocrat. The postmaster interposed himself between this man and the rider's bridle, at which he was evidently making, and soothingly said, let him be, let him be, he'll be judged at Paris. Judged, repeated the farrier, swinging his hammer, ay, and condemned as a traitor. At this the crowd roared approval. Checking the postmaster, who was for turning his horse's head to the yard, the drunken patriot sat composedly in his saddle, looking on with the line round his wrist. Darnay said, as soon as he could make his voice heard, "'Friends, you deceive yourselves, or you are deceived. I am not a traitor.' "'He lies!' cried the smith. "'He is a traitor since the decree. "'His life is forfeit to the people. "'His cursed life is not his own.' At the instant when Darnay saw a rush in the eyes of the crowd, which another instant would have brought upon him, the postmaster turned his horse into the yard, the escort rode in close upon his horse's flanks, and the postmaster shut and barred the crazy double gates. The farrier struck a blow upon them with his hammer, and the crowd groaned, but no more was done. "'What is this decree that the smith spoke of?' Darnay asked the postmaster, when he had thanked him, and stood beside him in the yard. "'Truly, a decree for selling the property of emigrants.' "'When passed?' "'On the fourteenth, the day I left England. Everybody says it is but one of several, and that there will be others, if there are not already, banishing all emigrants and condemning all to death who return. That is what he meant when he said your life was not your own. But there are no such decrees yet. What do I know? said the postmaster, shrugging his shoulders. There may be, or there will be, it's all the same. What would you have? They rested on some straw in a loft until the middle of the night, and then rode forward again when all the town was asleep. Among the many wild changes, observable on familiar things which made this wild ride unreal, not the least was the seeming rarity of sleep. 
after long and lonely spurring over dreary roads they would come to a cluster of poor cottages not steeped in darkness but all glittering with lights and would find the people in a ghostly manner in the dead of the night circling hand in hand round a shrivelled tree of liberty or all drawn up together singing a liberty song Happily, however, there was sleep in Beauvais that night to help them out of it, and they passed on once more into solitude and loneliness, jingling through the untimely cold and wet among impoverished fields that had yielded no fruits of the earth that year, diversified by the blackened remains of burnt houses, and by the sudden emergence from ambuscade and sharp reining up across their way of patriot patrols on on the watch on all the roads daylight at last found them before the wall of paris the barrier was closed and strongly guarded when they rode up to it where are the papers of this prisoner demanded a resolute looking man in authority who was summoned out by the guard naturally struck by the disagreeable word charles darnay requested the speaker to take notice that he was a free traveller and french citizen in charge of an escort which the disturbed state of the country had imposed upon him and which he had paid for where repeated the same personage without taking any heed of him whatever are the papers of this prisoner the drunken patriot had them in his cap and produced them casting his eyes over gobelle's letter the same personage in authority showed some disorder and surprise and looked at darnay with a close attention he left escort and escorted without saying a word however and went into the guard-room meanwhile they sat upon their horses outside the gate looking about him while in this state of suspense charles darnay observed that the gate was held by a mixed guard of soldiers and patriots the latter far outnumbering the former and that while ingress into the city for peasants carts bringing in supplies and for similar traffic and traffickers was easy enough egress even for the homeless people was very difficult a numerous medley of men and women not to mention beasts and vehicles of various sorts was waiting to issue forth but the previous identification was so strict that they filtered through the barrier very slowly some of these people knew their turn for examination to be so far off that they lay down on the ground to sleep or smoke while others talked together or loitered about the red cap and tricolour cockade were universal both among men and women when he had sat in his saddle some half hour taking note of these things darnay found himself confronted by the same man in authority who directed the guard to open the barrier then he delivered to the escort drunk and sober a receipt for the escorted and requested him to dismount he did so, and the two patriots leading his tired horse turned and rode away without entering the city. He accompanied his conductor into a guard-room, smelling of common wine and tobacco, where certain soldiers and patriots, asleep and awake, drunk and sober, and in various neutral states between sleeping and waking, drunkenness and sobriety, were standing and lying about the light in the guard-house half derived from the waning oil-lamps of the night and half from the overcast day was in some correspondingly uncertain condition some registers were lying open on a desk and an officer of a coarse dark aspect presided over these citizen defarge said he to darnay's conductor as he took a slip of paper to write on is this the emigrant Evremond? This is the man. Your age, Evremond? Thirty-seven. Married, Evremond? Yes. Where married? In England. Without doubt. Where is your wife, Evremond? In England. Without doubt. You are consigned, Evremond, to the prison of La Force. 
"'Just heaven!' exclaimed Darnay. "'Under what law? And for what offence? The officer looked up from his slip of paper for a moment. "'We have new laws, Evremond, and new offences since you were here.' He said it with a hard smile, and went on writing. "'I entreat you to observe that I have come here voluntarily, in response to that written appeal of a fellow-countryman which lies before you. I demand no more than the opportunity to do so without delay. Is not that my right?' "'Emigrants have no rights, Evremond,' was the stolid reply. The officer wrote until he had finished, read over to himself what he had written, sanded it, and handed it to Defarge with the words, "'In secret!' Defarge motioned with the paper to the prisoner that he must accompany him. The prisoner obeyed, and the guard of two armed patriots attended them. "'Is it you?' said Defarge, in a low voice, as they went down the guard-house steps and turned into Paris, who married the daughter of Dr. Manette, once a prisoner in the Bastille that is no more. "'Yes,' replied Darnay, looking at him with surprise. "'My name is Defarge, and I keep a wine-shop in the quarter Saint-Antoine. Possibly you have heard of me?' "'My wife came to your house to reclaim her father?' yes the word wife seemed to serve as a gloomy reminder to defarge to say with sudden impatience in the name of that sharp female newly born and called la guillotine why did you come to france you heard me say why a minute ago do you not believe it is the truth a bad truth for you, said Defarge, speaking with knitted brows, and looking straight before him. Indeed, I am lost here. All here is so unprecedented, so changed, so sudden and unfair, that I am absolutely lost. Will you render me a little help? None, Defarge spoke, always looking straight before him. Will you answer me a single question? Perhaps, according to its nature, you can say what it is. In this prison that I am going to so unjustly, shall I have some free communication with the world outside? You will see. I am not to be buried there, prejudged and without any means of presenting my case? You will see. But what, then? Other people have been similarly buried in worse prisons before now? but never by me, citizen Defarge. Defarge glanced darkly at him for answer, and walked on in a steady and set silence. The deeper he sank into this silence, the fainter hope there was, or so Darnay thought, of his softening in any slight degree. He therefore made haste to say, It is of the utmost importance to me, you know, citizen, even better than I, of how much importance, that I should be able to communicate to Mr. Lorry, of Tellson's Bank, an English gentleman who is now in Paris, the simple fact, without comment, that I have been thrown into the prison of La Force. Will you cause that to be done for me? I will do, Defarge doggedly rejoined, nothing for you. My duty is to my country and the people. I am the sworn servant of both, against you. I will do nothing for you. Charles Darnay felt it hopeless to entreat him further, and his pride was touched besides. As they walked on in silence, he could not but see how used the people were to the spectacle of prisoners passing along the streets. The very children scarcely noticed him. A few passers turned their heads, and a few shook their fingers at him as an aristocrat otherwise that a man in good clothes should be going to prison was no more remarkable than that a labourer in working clothes should be going to work in one narrow dark and dirty street through which they passed an excited orator mounted on a stool was addressing an excited audience on the crimes against the people of the king and the royal family the few words that he caught from this man's lips first made it known to charles darnay that the king was in prison and that the foreign ambassadors had one and all left paris 
On the road, except at Beauvais, he had heard absolutely nothing. The escort and the universal watchfulness had completely isolated him. That he had fallen among far greater dangers than those which had developed themselves when he left England, he of course knew now. That perils had thickened about him fast, and might thicken faster and faster yet, he of course knew now. He could not but admit to himself that he might not have made this journey if he could have foreseen the events of a few days. And yet his misgivings were not so dark as, imagined by the light of this later time, they would appear. Troubled as the future was, it was the unknown future, and in its obscurity there was ignorant hope. The horrible massacre, days and nights long, which, within a few rounds of the clock, was to set a great mark of blood upon the blessed garnering time of harvest, was as far out of his knowledge as if it had been a hundred thousand years away. The sharp female newly born, and called La Guillotine, was hardly known to him, or to the generality of people, by name. The frightful deeds that were to be soon done were probably unimagined at that time in the brains of the doers. How could they have a place in the shadowy conceptions of a gentle mind? Of unjust treatment in detention and hardship, and in cruel separation from his wife and child, he foreshadowed the likelihood or the certainty. But, beyond this, he dreaded nothing distinctly. With this on his mind, which was enough to carry into a dreary prison courtyard, he arrived at the prison of La Force. A man with a bloated face opened the strong wicket, to whom Defarge presented the emigrant Evremond. "'What the devil! How many more of them!' exclaimed the man with the bloated face. Defarge took his receipt without noticing the exclamation, and withdrew with his two fellow patriots. "'What the devil, I say again!' exclaimed the jailer, left with his wife. "'How many more?' The jailer's wife, being provided with no answer to the question, merely replied, "'One must have patience, my dear.' Three turnkeys who entered responsive to a bell she rang echoed the sentiment, and one added, For the love of liberty, which sounded in that place like an inappropriate conclusion. The prison of La Force was a gloomy prison, dark and filthy, and with a horrible smell of foul sleep in it extraordinary how soon the noisome flavour of imprisoned sleep becomes manifest in all such places that are ill cared for in secret too grumbled the jailer looking at the written paper as if i was not already full to bursting he stuck the paper on a file in an ill humour and charles darnay awaited his further pleasure for half an hour sometimes pacing to and fro in the strong arched room sometimes resting on a stone seat in either case detained to be imprinted on the memory of the chief and his subordinates come said the chief at length taking up his keys come with me emigrant through the dismal prison twilight his new charge accompanied him by corridor and staircase, many doors clanging and locking behind them, until they came into a large, low, vaulted chamber, crowded with prisoners of both sexes. The women were seated at a long table, reading and writing, knitting, sewing, and embroidering. The men were for the most part standing behind their chairs, or lingering up and down the room. In the instinctive association of prisoners with shameful crime and disgrace, the newcomer recoiled from this company. But the crowning unreality of his long unreal ride was, there all at once rising, to receive him, with every refinement of manner known to the time, and with all the engaging graces and courtesies of life. 
so strangely clouded were these refinements by the prison manners and gloom so spectral did they become in the inappropriate squalor and misery through which they were seen that charles darnay seemed to stand in a company of the dead ghosts all the ghost of beauty the ghost of stateliness the ghost of elegance the ghost of pride the ghost of frivolity the ghost of wit the ghost of youth the ghost of age all waiting their dismissal from the desolate shore all turning on him eyes that were changed by the death they had died in coming there it struck him motionless the jailer standing at his side and the other jailers moving about who would have been well enough as to appearance in the ordinary exercise of their functions looked so extravagantly coarse contrasted with sorrowing mothers and blooming daughters who were there with the apparitions of the coquette the young beauty and the mature woman delicately bred that the inversion of all experience and likelihood which the scene of shadows presented was heightened to its utmost surely ghosts all surely the long unreal ride some progress of disease that had brought him to these gloomy shades in the name of the assembled companions in misfortune said a gentleman of courtly appearance and address coming forward i have the honour of giving you welcome to la force and of condoling with you on the calamity that has brought you among us may it soon terminate happily it would be an impertinence elsewhere but it is not so here to ask your name and condition charles darnay roused himself and gave the required information in words as suitable as he could find but i hope said the gentleman following the chief jailer with his eyes who moved across the room that you are not in secret i do not understand the meaning of the term but i have heard them say so ah what a pity we so much regret it but take courage several members of our society have been in secret at first and it has lasted but a short time then he added raising his voice I grieve to inform the society in secret. There was a murmur of commiseration as Charles Darnay crossed the room to a grated door where the jailer awaited him, and many voices, among which the soft and compassionate voices of women were conspicuous, gave him good wishes and encouragement. He turned at the grated door to render the thanks of his heart it closed under the jailer's hand and the apparitions vanished from his sight for ever the wicket opened on a stone staircase leading upward when they had ascended forty steps the prisoner of half an hour already counted them the jailer opened a low black door and they passed into a solitary cell it struck cold and damp but was not dark yours said the jailer why am i confined alone how do i know i can buy pen ink and paper such are not my orders you will be visited and can ask then at present you may buy your food and nothing more there were in the cell a chair a table and a straw mattress as the jailer made a general inspection of these objects and of the four walls before going out a wandering fancy wandered through the mind of the prisoner leaning against the wall opposite to him that this jailer was so unwholesomely bloated both in face and person as to look like a man who had been drowned and filled with water when the jailer was gone he thought in the same wandering way now am i left as if i were dead stopping then to look down at the mattress he turned from it with a sick feeling and thought and here in these crawling creatures is the first condition of the body after death five paces by four and a half five paces by four and a half five paces by four and a half 
the prisoner walked to and fro in his cell counting its measurement and the roar of the city arose like muffled drums with a wild swell of voices added to them he made shoes he made shoes he made shoes the prisoner counted the measurement again and paced faster to draw his mind with him from that latter repetition the ghosts that vanished when the wicket closed there was one among them the appearance of a lady dressed in black who was leaning in the embrasure of a window and she had a light shining upon her golden hair and she looked like let us ride on again for god's sake through the illuminated villages with the people all awake he made shoes he made shoes he made shoes five paces by four and a half with such scraps tossing and rolling upward from the depths of his mind the prisoner walked faster and faster obstinately counting and counting and the roar of the city changed to this extent that it still rolled in like muffled drums but with the wail of voices that he knew in the swell that rose above them end of book three chapter one Record A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book the Third, The Track of a Storm Chapter Two Telson's Bank, established in the Saint-Germain quarter of Paris, was in a wing of a large house, approached by a courtyard, and shut off from the street by a high wall and a strong gate. The house belonged to a great nobleman, who had lived in it until he made a flight from the troubles, in his own cook's dress, and got across the borders. A mere beast of the chase, flying from hunters. He was still in his metempsychosis no other than the same Monseigneur, the preparation of whose chocolate for whose lips had once occupied three strong men beside the cook in question. Monseigneur gone, and the three strong men absolving themselves from the sin of having drawn his high wages by being more than ready and willing to cut his throat on the altar of the dawning republic, one and indivisible of liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, Monseigneur's house had been first sequestrated and then confiscated for all things moved so fast and decree followed decree with that fierce precipitation that now upon the third night of the autumn month of september patriot emissaries of the law were in possession of monseigneur's house and had marked it with the tricolour and were drinking brandy in its state apartments a place of business in london like tellson's place of business in paris would soon have driven the house out of its mind and into the gazette for what would staid british responsibility and respectability have said to orange trees in boxes in a bank courtyard and even to a cupid over the counter yet such things were Telson's had whitewashed the cupid but he was still to be seen on the ceiling in the coolest linen aiming as he very often does at money from morning to night bankruptcy must inevitably have come of this young pagan in lombard street london and also of a curtained alcove in the rear of the immortal boy and also of a looking-glass let into the wall and also of clerks not at all old who danced in public on the slightest provocation yet a french telson's could get on with these things exceedingly well and as long as the times held together no man had taken fright at them and drawn out his money what money would be drawn out of telson's henceforth and what would lie there lost and forgotten what plate and jewels would tarnish in telson's hiding-places while the depositors rusted in prisons and when they should have violently perished how many accounts with telson's never to be balanced in this world must be carried over into the next no man could have said that night any more than mr jarvis lorry could though he thought heavily of these questions he sat by a newly lighted wood fire the blighted and unfruitful year was prematurely cold 
and on his honest and courageous face there was a deeper shade than the pendant lamp could throw or any object in the room distortedly reflect a shade of horror he occupied rooms in the bank in his fidelity to the house of which he had grown to be a part like strong root ivy it chanced that they derived a kind of security from the patriotic occupation of the main building but the true-hearted old gentleman never calculated about that all such circumstances were indifferent to him so that he did his duty on the opposite side of the courtyard under a colonnade was extensive standing for carriages where indeed some carriages of monseigneur yet stood against two of the pillars were fastened two great flaring flambeaux and in the light of these standing out in the open air was a large grindstone a roughly mounted thing which appeared to have hurriedly been brought there from some neighbouring smithy or other workshop rising and looking out of window at these harmless objects mr lorry shivered and retired to his seat by the fire he had opened not only the glass window but the lattice blind outside it and he closed both again and he shivered through his frame from the streets beyond the high wall and the strong gate there came the usual night hum of the city with now and then an indescribable ring in it weird and unearthly as if some unwanted sounds of a terrible nature were going up to heaven thank god said mr lorry clasping his hands that no one near and dear to me is in this dreadful town to-night may he have mercy on all who are in danger soon afterwards the bell at the great gate sounded and he thought they have come back and sat listening but there was no loud eruption into the courtyard as he had expected and he heard the gate clash again and all was quiet the nervousness and dread that were upon him inspired that vague uneasiness respecting the bank which a great change would naturally awaken with such feelings roused it was well guarded and he got up to go among the trusty people who were watching it when his door suddenly opened and two figures rushed in at sight of which he fell back in amazement lucy and her father lucy lucy with her arms stretched out to him and with that old look of earnestness so concentrated and intensified that it seemed as though it had been stamped upon her face expressly to give force and power to it in this one passage of her life what is this cried mr lorry breathless and confused what is the matter lucy manette what has happened what has brought you here what is this with the look fixed upon him in her paleness and wildness she panted out in his arms imploringly oh my dear friend my husband your husband lucy charles what of charles here here in paris has been here some days three or four i don't know how many i can't collect my thoughts an errand of generosity brought him here unknown to us he was stopped at the barrier and sent to prison the old man uttered an irrepressible cry almost at the same moment the beg of the great gate rang again and a loud noise of feet and voices came pouring into the courtyard what is that noise said the doctor turning towards the window don't look cried mr lorry don't look out manette for your life don't touch the blind the doctor turned with his hand upon the fastening of the window and said with a cool bold smile my dear friend 
I have a charmed life in this city. I have been a Bastille prisoner. There is no patriot in Paris, in Paris, in France, who, knowing me to have been a prisoner in the Bastille, would touch me, except to overwhelm me with embraces, or carry me in triumph. My old pain has given me a power that has brought us through the barrier, and gained us news of Charles there, and brought us here. I knew it would be so. I knew I could help Charles out of all danger. I told Lucy so. What is that noise? His hand was again upon the window. Don't look! cried Mr. Lorry, absolutely desperate. No, Lucy, my dear, not you. He got his arm round her and held her. Don't be so terrified, my love. I solemnly swear to you that I know of no harm having happened to Charles, that I had no suspicion even of his being in this fatal place. What prison is he in? La Force! La Force! Lucy, my child, if ever you were brave and serviceable in your life, and you were always both, you will compose yourself now to do exactly as I bid you, for more depends upon it than you can think, or I can say. There is no help for you in any action on your part to-night. You cannot possibly stir out. I say this because what I must bid you to do for Charles' sake is the hardest thing to do of all. You must instantly be obedient, still, and quiet. You must let me put you in a room at the back here. You must leave your father and me alone for two minutes, and as there are life and death in the world, you must not delay. I will be submissive to you. I see in your face that you know I can do nothing else than this. I know you are true. The old man kissed her and hurried her into his room and turned the key then came hurrying back to the doctor and opened the window and partly opened the blind and put his hand upon the doctor's arm and looked out with him into the courtyard looked out upon a throng of men and women not enough in number or near enough to fill the courtyard not more than forty or fifty in all the people in possession of the house had let them in at the gate, and they had rushed in to work at the grindstone. It had evidently been set up there for their purpose, as in a convenient and retired spot. But such awful workers, and such awful work! The grindstone had a double handle, and, turning at it madly, were two men, whose faces, as their long hair flapped back when the whirlings of the grindstone brought their faces up, were more horrible and cruel than the visages of the wildest savages in their most barbarous disguise. False eyebrows and false moustaches were stuck upon them, and their hideous countenances were all bloody and sweaty, and all awry with howling, and all staring and glaring with beastly excitement and want of sleep. As these ruffians turned and turned, their matted locks now flung forward over their eyes, now flung backward over their necks, some women held wine to their mouths that they might drink, and what with dropping blood, and what with dropping wine, and what with the stream of sparks struck out of the stone, all their wicked atmosphere seemed gore and fire. The eye could not detect one creature in the group free from the smear of blood. Shouldering one another to get next at the sharpening stone were men stripped to the waist, with the stain all over their limbs and bodies, men in all sorts of rags, with the stain upon those rags, men devilishly set off with spoils of women's lace and silk and ribbon, with the stain dyeing those trifles through and through, hatchets, knives, bayonets, swords, all brought to be sharpened were all red with it. Some of the hacked swords were tied to the wrists of those who carried them with strips of linen and fragments of dress, ligatures various in kind, but all deep of the one colour. 
and as the frantic wielders of these weapons snatched them from the stream of sparks and tore away into the streets the same red hue was red in their frenzied eyes eyes which any unbrutalized beholder would have given twenty years of life to petrify with a well-directed gun all this was seen in a moment as the vision of a drowning man or of any human creature to any very great pass could see a world if it were there they drew back from the window and the doctor looked for explanation in his friend's ashy face they are mr lorry whispered the words glancing fearfully round at the locked room murdering the prisoners if you are sure of what you say if you really have the power you think you have as i believe you have make yourself known to these devils and get taken to la force it may be too late i don't know but let it not be a minute later dr manette pressed his hand hastened bareheaded out of the room and was in the courtyard when mr lorry regained the blind his streaming white hair his remarkable face and the impetuous confidence of his manner as he put the weapons aside like water carried him in an instant to the heart of the concourse at the stone for a few moments there was a pause and a hurry and a murmur and the unintelligible sound of his voice and then mr lorry saw him surrounded by all and in the midst of a line of twenty men long all linked shoulder to shoulder and hand to shoulder hurried out with cries of live the bastille prisoner help for the bastille prisoner's kindred in la force room for the bastille prisoner in front there save the prisoner every Mond at la force and a thousand answering shouts he closed the lattice again with a fluttering heart closed the window and the curtain hastened to lucy and told her that her father was assisted by the people and gone in search of her husband he found her child and miss pross with her but it never occurred to him to be surprised by their appearance until a long time afterwards when he sat watching them in such quiet as the night knew lucy had by that time fallen into a stupor on the floor at his feet clinging to his hand miss pross had laid the child down on his own bed and her head had gradually fallen on the pillow beside her pretty charge oh the long long night with the moans of the poor wife and oh the long long night with no return of her father and no tidings twice more in the darkness the bell at the great gate sounded and the eruption was repeated and the grindstone whirled and spluttered what is it cried lucy affrighted hush the soldiers swords are sharpened there said mr lorry the place is national property now and used as a kind of armoury my love twice more in all but the last spell of work was feeble and fitful soon afterwards the day began to dawn and he softly detached himself from the clasping hand and cautiously looked out again a man so besmeared that he might have been a sorely wounded soldier creeping back to consciousness on a field of slain was rising from the pavement by the side of the grindstone and looking about him with a vacant air shortly this worn-out murderer descried in the imperfect light one of the carriages of monseigneur and staggering to that gorgeous vehicle climbed in at the door and shut himself up to take his rest on its dainty cushions the great grindstone earth had turned when mr lorry looked out again and the sun was red on the courtyard but the lesser grindstone stood alone there in the calm morning air with a red upon it that the sun had never given and would never take away end of book three chapter two Re a tale of two cities by charles dickens book the third the track of a storm chapter three the shadow 
one of the first considerations which arose in the business mind of mr lorry when business hours came round was this that he had no right to imperil tellson's by sheltering the wife of an emigrant prisoner under the bank roof his own possessions safety life he would have hazarded for lucy and her child without a moment's demur but the great trust he held was not his own and as to that business charge he was a strict man of business at first his mind reverted to defarge and he thought of finding out the wine-shop again and taking counsel with its master in reference to the safest dwelling-place in the distracted state of the city but the same consideration that suggested him repudiated him he lived in the most violent quarter and doubtless was influential there and deep in its dangerous workings noon coming and the doctor not returning and every minute's delay tending to compromise tellson's mr lorry advised with lucy she said that her father had spoken of hiring a lodging for a short term in that quarter near the banking-house as there was no business objection to this and as he foresaw that even if it were all well with charles and he were to be released he could not hope to leave the city mr lorry went out in quest of such a lodging and found a suitable one high up in a removed by-street where the closed blinds in all the other windows of a high melancholy square of buildings marked deserted homes to this lodging he at once removed lucy and her child and miss pross giving them what comfort he could and much more than he had himself he left jerry with them as a figure to fill a doorway that would bear considerable knocking on the head and retained to his own occupations a disturbed and doleful mind he brought to bear upon them and slowly and heavily the day lagged on with him it wore itself out and wore him out with it until the bank closed he was again alone in his room of the previous night considering what to do next when he heard a foot upon the stair in a few moments a man stood in his presence who with a keenly observant look at him addressed him by his name your servant said mr lorry do you know me he was a strongly made man with dark curling hair from forty-five to fifty years of age for answer he repeated without any change of emphasis the words do you know me i have seen you somewhere perhaps at my wine shop much interested and agitated mr lorry said you come from dr manette yes i come from dr manette and what says he what does he send me defarge gave into his anxious hand an open scrap of paper it bore the words in the doctor's writing charles is safe but i cannot safely leave this place yet i have obtained the favour that the bearer has a short note from charles to his wife let the bearer see his wife it was dated from la force within an hour will you accompany me said mr lorry joyfully relieved after reading this note aloud to where his wife resides yes returned defarge scarcely noticing as yet in what a curiously reserved and mechanical way defarge spoke mr lorry put on his hat and they went down into the courtyard there they found two women one knitting madame defarge surely said miss lorry who had left her in exactly the same attitude some seventeen years ago it is she observed her husband does madame go with us inquired mr lorry seeing that she moved as they moved yes that she may be able to recognize the faces and know the persons it is for their safety Beginning to be struck by Defarge's manner, Mr. Lorry looked dubiously at him, and led the way. Both the women followed, the second woman being the vengeance. 
They passed through the intervening streets as quickly as they might, ascended the staircase of the new domicile, were admitted by Jerry, and found Lucy weeping, alone. She was thrown into a transport by the tidings Mr. Lorry gave her of her husband, and clasped the hand that delivered his note, little thinking what it had been doing near him in the night, and might, but for a chance, have done to him. Dearest, take courage. I am well, and your father has influence around me. You cannot answer this. Kiss our child for me. That was all the writing. It was so much, however, to her who received it, that she turned from Defarge to his wife and kissed one of the hands that knitted. It was a passionate, loving, thankful, womanly action. But the hand made no response, dropped cold and heavy, and took to its knitting again. There was something in its touch that gave Lucy a check. She stopped in the act of putting the note in her bosom, and, with her hands yet at her neck, looked terrified at Madame Defarge. Madame Defarge met the lifted eyebrows and forehead with a cold, impassive stare. "'My dear,' said Mr. Lorry, striking in to explain, "'there are frequent risings in the streets, "'and although it is not likely they will ever trouble you, "'Madame Defarge wishes to see those whom she has the power to protect "'at such times, to the end that she may know them, "'that she may identify them, I believe,' said Mr. Lorry, "'rather halting in his reassuring words, "'as the stony manner of all the three impressed itself upon him more and more. "'I state the case, citizen Defarge?' "'Defarge looked gloomily at his wife, "'and gave no other answer than a gruff sound of acquiescence. "'You had better, Lucy,' said Mr. Lorry, "'doing all he could to propitiate by tone and manner. "'Have the dear child here, and our good Pross. "'Our good Pross, Defarge, is an English lady, and knows no French.' "'The lady in question, whose rooted conviction "'that she was more than a match for any foreigner, "'was not to be shaken by distress and danger, "'appeared with folded arms, "'and observed in English to the vengeance "'whom her eyes first encountered. "'Well, I am sure, bold face, "'I hope you are pretty well.' "'She also bestowed a British cough on Madame Defarge, "'but neither of the two took much heed of her. "'Is this his child?' said Madame Defarge, stopping in her work for the first time, and pointing her knitting-needle at little Lucy, as if it were the finger of fate. "'Yes, madame,' answered Mr. Lorry. "'This is our poor prisoner's darling daughter, and only child.' The shadow attendant on Madame Defarge and her party seemed to fall so threatening and dark on the child that her mother instinctively kneeled on the ground beside her and held her to her breast. The shadow attendant on Madame Defarge and her party seemed then to fall, threatening and dark, on both the mother and the child. "'It is enough, my husband,' said Madame Defarge. "'I have seen them. We may go.' But the suppressed manner had enough of menace in it, not visible and presented, but indistinct and withheld, to alarm Lucy into saying, as she laid her appealing hand on Madame Defarge's dress, "'You will be good to my poor husband. You will do him no harm. You will help me to see him if you can?' "'Your husband is not my business here,' returned Madame Defarge, looking down at her with perfect composure. "'It is the daughter of your father who is my business here.' "'For my sake, then, be merciful to my husband, for my child's sake. She will put her hands together and pray you to be merciful. We are more afraid of you than of these others.' Madame Defarge received it as a compliment, and looked at her husband. Defarge, who had been uneasily biting his thumbnail and looking at her, collected his face into a sterner expression. "'What is it that your husband says in that little letter?' asked Madame Defarge, with a lowering smile. "'Influence? He says something touching influence?' "'That my father,' said Lucy, hurriedly taking the paper from her breast, but with her alarmed eyes on her questioner, and not on it, has much influence around him. 
"'Surely it will release him,' said Madame Defarge. "'Let it do so.' as a wife and mother cried lucy most earnestly i implore you to have pity on me and not to exercise any power that you possess against my innocent husband but to use it in his behalf o oh, sister woman think of me as a wife and mother madame defarge looked coldly as ever at the suppliant and said turning to her friend the vengeance the wives and mothers we have been used to see since we were as little as this child and much less have not been greatly considered we have known their husbands and fathers laid in prison and kept from them often enough all our lives we have seen our sister women suffer in themselves and in their children poverty nakedness hunger thirst sickness misery oppression and neglect of all kinds we have seen nothing else returned the vengeance we have borne this a long time said madame defarge turning her eyes again upon lucy judge you is it likely that the trouble of one wife and mother would be much to us now she resumed her knitting and went out the vengeance followed defarge went last and closed the door courage my dear lucy said mr lorry as he raised her courage courage so far all goes well with us much much better than it has of late gone with many poor souls cheer up and have a thankful heart i am not thankless i hope but that dreadful woman seems to throw a shadow on me and on all my hopes tut tut said mr lorry what is this despondency in the brave little breast a shadow indeed no substance in it lucy but the shadow of the manner of these defarges was dark upon himself for all that and in his secret mind it troubled him greatly end of book three chapter three a tale of two cities by charles dickens Book the Third, The Track of a Storm. Chapter Four, Calm in Storm. Dr. Manette did not return until the morning of the fourth day of his absence. So much of what had happened in that dreadful time as could be kept from the knowledge of Lucy was so well concealed from her that not until long afterwards, when France and she were far apart, did she know that eleven hundred defenceless prisoners of both sexes and all ages had been killed by the populace, that four days and nights had been darkened by this deed of horror, and that the air around her had been tainted by the slain she only knew that there had been an attack upon the prisons that all political prisoners had been in danger and that some had been dragged out by the crowd and murdered to mr lorry the doctor communicated under an injunction of secrecy on which he had no need to dwell that the crowd had taken him through a scene of carnage to the prison of la force that in the prison he had found a self-appointed tribunal sitting before which the prisoners were brought singly and by which they were rapidly ordered to be put forth to be massacred or to be released or in a few cases to be sent back to their cells that presented by his conductors to this tribunal he had announced himself by name and profession as having been for eighteen years a secret and unaccused prisoner in the bastille that one of the bodies so sitting in judgment had risen and identified him and that this man was defarge that hereupon he had ascertained through the registers on the table that his son-in-law was among the living prisoners and had pleaded hard to the tribunal of whom some members were asleep and some awake some dirty with murder and some clean some sober and some not for his life and liberty that in the first frantic greetings lavished on him as a notable sufferer under the overthrown system it had been accorded to him to have charles darnay brought before the lawless court and examined that he seemed on the point of being at once released when the tide in his favour met with some unexplained check not intelligible to the doctor which led to a few words of secret conference 
that the man sitting as president had then informed dr manette that the prisoner must remain in custody but should for his sake be held inviolate in safe custody that immediately on a signal the prisoner was removed to the interior of the prison again but that he the doctor had then so strongly pleaded for permission to remain and assure himself that his son-in-law was through no malice or mischance delivered to the concourse whose murderous yells outside the gate had often drowned the proceedings that he had obtained the permission and had remained in that hall of blood until the danger was over the sights he had seen there with brief snatches of food and sleep by intervals should remain untold the mad joy over the prisoners who were saved had astounded him scarcely less than the mad ferocity against those who were cut to pieces one prisoner there was he said who had been discharged into the street free but at whom a mistaken savage had thrust a pike as he passed out being besought to go to him and dress the wound the doctor had passed out at the same gate and had found him in the arms of a company of samaritans who were seated on the bodies of their victims with an inconsistency as monstrous as anything in this awful nightmare they had helped the healer and tended the wounded man with the gentlest solicitude had made a litter for him and escorted him carefully from the spot had then caught up their weapons and plunged anew into a butchery so dreadful that the doctor had covered his eyes with his hands and swooned away in the midst of it as mr lorry received these confidences and as he watched the face of his friend now sixty-two years of age a misgiving arose within him that such dread experiences would revive the old danger but he had never seen his friend in his present aspect he had never at all known him in his present character for the first time the doctor felt now that his suffering was strength and power for the first time he felt that in that sharp fire he had slowly forged the iron which could break the prison door of his daughter's husband and deliver him it all tended to a good end my friend it was not mere waste and ruin as my beloved child was helpful in restoring me to myself i will be helpful now in restoring the dearest part of herself to her by the aid of heaven i will do it thus dr manette and when jarvis lorry saw the kindled eyes the resolute face the calm strong look and bearing of the man whose life always seemed to him to have been stopped like a clock for so many years and then set going again with an energy which had lain dormant during the cessation of its usefulness he believed greater things than the doctor had at that time to contend with would have yielded before his persevering purpose while he kept himself in his place as a physician whose business was with all degrees of mankind bond and free rich and poor bad and good he used his personal influence so wisely that he was soon the inspecting physician of three prisons and among them of la force he could now assure lucy that her husband was no longer confined alone but was mixed with the general body of prisoners he saw her husband weekly and brought sweet messages to her straight from his lips sometimes her husband himself sent a letter to her though never by the doctor's hand but she was not permitted to write to him for among the many wild suspicions of plots in the prisons the wildest of all pointed at emigrants who were known to have made friends or permanent connections abroad this new life of the doctor's was an anxious life no doubt still the sagacious mr lorry saw that there was a new sustaining pride in it nothing unbecoming tinged the pride it was a natural and worthy one but he observed it as a curiosity the doctor knew that up to that time his imprisonment had been associated in the minds of his daughter and his friend with his personal affliction deprivation and weakness 
now that this was changed and he knew himself to be invested through that old trial with forces to which they both looked for charles ultimate safety and deliverance he became so far exalted by the change that he took the lead and direction and required them as the weak to trust to him as the strong the preceding relative positions of himself and lucy were reversed yet only as the liveliest gratitude and affection could reverse them for he could have had no pride but in rendering some service to her who had rendered so much to him all curious to see thought mr lorry in his amiable shrewd way but all natural and right so take the lead my dear friend and keep it it couldn't be in better hands but though the doctor tried hard and never ceased trying to get charles darnay set at liberty or at least to get him brought to trial the public current of the time set too strong and fast for him the new era began the king was tried doomed and beheaded the republic of liberty equality fraternity or death declared for victory or death against the world in arms the black flag waved night and day from the great towers of notre dame three hundred thousand men summoned to rise against the tyrants of the earth rose from all the varying soils of france as if the dragon's teeth had been sown broadcast and had yielded fruit equally on hill and plain on rock in gravel and alluvial mud under the bright sky of the south and under the clouds of the north in fell and forest in the vineyards and the olive grounds and among the cropped grass and the stubble of the corn along the fruitful banks of the broad rivers and in the sand of the seashore what private solicitude could rear itself against the deluge of the year one of liberty the deluge rising from below not falling from above and with the windows of heaven shut not opened there was no pause no pity no peace no interval of relenting rest no measurement of time through days and nights circled as regularly as when time was young and the evening and morning were the first day other count of time there was none hold of it was lost in the raging fever of a nation as it is in the fever of one patient now breaking the unnatural silence of a whole city the executioner showed the people the head of the king and now it seemed almost in the same breath the head of his fair wife which had had eight weary months of imprisoned widowhood and misery to turn it grey and yet observing the strange law of contradiction which obtains in all such cases the time was long while it flamed by so fast a revolutionary tribunal in the capital and forty or fifty thousand revolutionary committees all over the land a law of the suspected which struck away all security for liberty or life and delivered over any good and innocent person to any bad and guilty one prisons gorged with people who had committed no offence and could obtain no hearing these things became the established order and nature of appointed things and seemed to be ancient usage before they were many weeks old above all one hideous figure grew as familiar as if it had been before the general gaze from the foundations of the world the figure of the sharp female called la guillotine it was the popular theme for jests it was the best cure for headache it infallibly prevented the hair from turning grey it imparted a peculiar delicacy to the complexion it was the national razor which shaved close who kissed la guillotine looked through the little window and sneezed into the sack it was the sign of the regeneration of the human race it superseded the cross models of it were worn on breasts from which the cross was discarded and it was bowed down to and believed in where the cross was denied 
It sheared off heads so many that it and the ground it most polluted were a rotten red. It was taken to pieces like a toy puzzle for a young devil, and was put together again when the occasion wanted it. It hushed the eloquent, struck down the powerful, abolished the beautiful and good. Twenty-two friends of high public mark, twenty-one living and one dead, it had lopped the heads off in one morning in as many minutes. The name of the strong man of old scripture had descended to the chief functionary who worked it, but, so armed, he was stronger than his namesake, and blinder, and tore away the gates of God's own temple every day. Among these terrors, and the brood belonging to them, the doctor walked with a steady head, confident in his power, cautiously persistent in his end, never doubting that he would save Lucy's husband at last. Yet the current of the time swept by, so strong and deep, and carried the time away so fiercely, that Charles had lain in prison one year and three months, when the doctor was thus steady and confident. So much more wicked and distracted had the revolution grown in that December month, that the rivers of the south were encumbered with the bodies of the violently drowned by night, and prisoners were shot in lines and squares, under the southern wintry sun. Still the doctor walked among the terrors with a steady head. No man better known than he in Paris at that day, no man in a stranger situation, silent, humane, indispensable in hospital and prison, using his art equally among assassins and victims. He was a man apart. In the exercise of his skill, the appearance and the story of the Bastille captive removed him from all other men. He was not suspected or brought in question, any more than if he had indeed been recalled to life, some eighteen years before, or were a spirit moving among mortals. End of Book Three, Chapter Four. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book the Third, The Track of a Storm. Chapter Five, The Wood Saw. One year and three months. During all that time Lucy was never sure from hour to hour but that the guillotine would strike off her husband's head next day. Every day through the stony streets the tumbrils now jolted heavily, filled with condemned. Lovely girls, bright women, brown-haired, black-haired and grey, youths, stalwart men and old, gentle-born and peasant-born, all red wine for la guillotine, all daily brought into light from the dark cellars of the loathsome prisons, and carried to her through the streets to slake her devouring thirst. Liberty, equality, fraternity, or death, the last much the easiest to bestow, O guillotine. If the suddenness of her calamity and the whirling wheels of the time had stunned the doctor's daughter into awaiting the result in idle despair, it would but have been with her as it was with many. But from the hour when she had taken the white head to her fresh young bosom in the garret of St. Antoine, she had been true to her duties. She was truest to them in the season of trial, as all the quietly loyal and good will always be. As soon as they were established in their new residence, and her father had entered on the routine of his avocations, she arranged the little household as exactly as if her husband had been there. Everything had its appointed place and its appointed time. Little Lucy she taught as regularly as if they had all been united in their English home. The slight devices with which she cheated herself into the show of a belief that they would soon be reunited, the little preparations for his speedy return, the setting aside of his chair and his books, these, and the solemn prayer at night for one dear prisoner especially, among the many unhappy souls in prison and the shadow of death, were almost the only outspoken reliefs of her heavy mind. 
she did not greatly alter in appearance the plain dark dresses akin to mourning dresses which she and her child wore were as neat and as well attended to as the brighter clothes of happy days she lost her colour and the old and intent expression was a constant not an occasional thing otherwise she remained very pretty and comely sometimes at night on kissing her father she would burst into the grief she had repressed all day and would say that her sole reliance under heaven was on him he always resolutely answered nothing can happen to him without my knowledge and i know that i can save him lucy they had not made the round of their changed life many weeks when her father said to her on coming home one evening my dear there is an upper window in the prison to which charles can sometimes gain access at three in the afternoon when he can get to it which depends on many uncertainties and incidents he might see you in the street he thinks if you stood in a certain place that i can show you but you will not be able to see him my poor child and even if you could it would be unsafe for you to make a sign of recognition oh show me the place my father and i will go there every day from that time in all weathers she waited there two hours as the clock struck two she was there and at four she turned resignedly away when it was not too wet or inclement for her child to be with her they went together at other times she was alone but she never missed a single day it was the dark and dirty corner of a small winding street the hovel of a cutter of wood into lengths for burning was the only house at that end all else was wall on the third day of her being there he noticed her good day citizeness good day citizen this mode of address was now prescribed by decree it had been established voluntarily some time ago among the more thorough patriots but was now law for everybody walking here again citizeness you see me citizen the wood sawyer who was a little man with a redundancy of gesture he had once been a mender of roads cast a glance at the prison pointed at the prison and putting his ten fingers before his face to represent bars peeped through them jocosely but it's not my business said he and went on sawing his wood next day he was looking out for her and accosted her the moment she appeared what walking here again citizeness yes citizen ah a child too your mother is it not my little citizeness do i say yes mamma whispered little lucy drawing close to her yes dearest yes citizen ah but it is not my business my work is my business see my saw i call it my little guillotine la 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 and off his head comes the billet fell as he spoke and he threw it into a basket i call myself the samson of the firewood guillotine see here again loo 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 and off her head comes now a child tickle tickle pickle pickle and off its head comes all the family lucy shuddered as he threw two more billets into his basket but it was impossible to be there while the wood sawyer was at work and not be in his sight thenceforth to secure his good will she always spoke to him first and often gave him drink money which he readily received he was an inquisitive fellow and sometimes when she had quite forgotten him in gazing at the prison roof and grates and in lifting her heart up to her husband she would come to herself to find him looking at her with his knee on his bench and his saw stopped in its work but it's not my business he would generally say at those times and would briskly fall to his sawing again in all weathers in the snow and frost of winter in the bitter winds of spring in the hot sunshine of summer in the rains of autumn and again in the snow and frost of winter lucy passed two hours of every day at this place and every day on leaving it she kissed the prison wall 
Her husband saw her, so she learned from her father. It might be once in five or six times. It might be twice or thrice running. It might be not for a week or a fortnight together. It was enough that he could and did see her when the chances served, and on that possibility he would have waited out the day seven days a week. These occupations brought her round to the December month, wherein her father walked among the terrors with a steady head. On a lightly snowing afternoon she arrived at the usual corner. It was a day of some wild rejoicing, and a festival. She had seen the houses, as she came along, decorated with little pikes, and with little red caps stuck upon them, also with tricoloured ribbons, also with the standard inscription, tricoloured letters were the favourite, Republic one and indivisible, liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. The miserable shop of the wood sawyer was so small that its whole surface furnished very indifferent space for this legend. He had got somebody to scrawl it up for him, however, who had squeezed death in with most inappropriate difficulty. On his housetop he displayed pike and cap, as a good citizen must, and in a window he had stationed his saw, inscribed as his little saint guillotine, for the great sharp female was by that time popularly canonized. His shop was shut, and he was not there, which was a relief to Lucy, and left her quite alone. But he was not far off for presently she heard a troubled movement and a shouting coming along which filled her with fear a moment afterwards and a throng of people came pouring round the corner by the prison wall in the midst of whom was the wood sawyer hand in hand with the vengeance there could not be fewer than five hundred people and they were dancing like five thousand demons there was no other music than their own singing they danced to the popular revolution song Song, keeping a ferocious time that was like a gnashing of teeth in unison. Men and women danced together, women danced together, men danced together as Hazard had brought them together. At first they were a mere storm of coarse red caps and coarse woollen rags, but as they filled the place and stopped to dance about Lucy, some ghastly apparition of a dance figure gone raving mad arose among them. They advanced, retreated, struck at one another's hands, clutched at one another other's heads, spun round alone, caught one another, and spun round in pairs until many of them dropped, while those were down, the rest linked hand in hand, and all spun round together. Then the ring broke, and in separate rings of two and four they turned and turned until they all stopped at once, began again, struck, clutched and tore, and then reversed the spin, and all spun round another way. Suddenly they stopped again, paused, struck out the time afresh, formed into lines the width of the public way, and, with their heads low down and their hands high up, swooped screaming off. No fight could have been half so terrible as this dance. It was so emphatically a fallen sport, a something once innocent delivered over to all devilry, a healthy pastime changed into a means of angering the blood, bewildering the senses, and stealing the heart. Such grace as was visible in it made it the uglier, showing how warped and perverted all things good by nature were become. The maidenly bosom bared to this, the pretty almost child's head thus distracted, the delicate foot mincing in this slough of blood and dirt, were types of the disjointed time. This was the Carmignol, as it passed, leaving Lucy frightened and bewildered in the doorway of the wood sawyer's house. The feathery snow fell as quietly and lay as white and soft as if it had never been. Oh, my father! For he stood before her when she lifted up the eyes she had momentarily darkened with her hand. Such a cruel, bad sight! I know, my dear, I know. I have seen it many times. Don't be frightened. Not one of them would harm you. 
I am not frightened for myself and my father, but when I think of my husband and the mercies of these people. We will set him above their mercies very soon. I left him climbing to the window, and I came to tell you there is no one here to see. You may kiss your hand towards that highest shelving roof. I do so, father, and I send him my soul with it. You cannot see him, my poor dear. No, father, said Lucy, yearning and weeping as she kissed her hand. No. A footstep in the snow. Madame Defarge. I salute you, citizeness, from the doctor. I salute you, citizen. This in passing, nothing more. Madame Defarge gone like a shadow over the white road. Give me your arm, my love. Pass from here with an air of cheerfulness and courage, for his sake. That was well done. They had left the spot. It shall not be in vain. Charles is summoned for to-morrow. For to-morrow? There is no time to lose. I am well prepared, but there are precautions to be taken that could not be taken until he was actually summoned before the tribunal. He has not received the notice yet, but I know that he will presently be summoned for to-morrow and removed to the conciergerie. I have timely information. You are not afraid? She could scarcely answer. I trust in you. Do so implicitly. Your suspense is nearly ended, my darling. He shall be restored to you within a few hours. I have encompassed him with every protection. I must see Lorry. He stopped. There was a heavy lumbering of wheels within hearing. They both knew too well what it meant. One, two, three, three tumbrils faring away with their dread loads over the hushing snow. I must see Lorry, the doctor repeated, turning her another way. The staunch old gentleman was still in his trust, had never left it. He and his books were in frequent requisition as to property confiscated and made national. What he could save for the owners, he saved. No better man living to hold fast by what Telson's had in keeping and to hold his peace. A murky red and yellow sky and a rising mist from the Seine denoted the approach of darkness. It was almost dark when they arrived at the bank. The stately residence of Monseigneur was altogether blighted and deserted. Above a heap of dust and ashes in the court ran the letters, National Property, Republic One and Indivisible, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, or Death. Who could that be with Mr. Lorry, the owner of the riding-coat upon the chair, who must not be seen? From whom, newly arrived, did he come out, agitated and surprised, to take his favourite in his arms? To whom did he appear, to repeat her faltering words, when, raising his voice and turning his head towards the door of the room, from which he had issued, he said, removed to the conciergerie, and summoned for to-morrow? End of Book 3, Chapter 5, Record A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens Book the Third, The Track of a Storm Chapter 6, Triumph The Dread Tribunal of Five Judges, Public Prosecutor and Determined Jury, sat every day. Their lists went forth every evening, and were read out by the jailers of the various prisons to their prisoners. The standard jailer joke was, "'Come out and listen to the evening paper, you inside there! Charles Evremond called Darnay!' So at last began the evening paper at La Force. When a name was called, its owner stepped apart into a spot reserved for those who were announced as being thus fatally recorded. Charles Evremond, called Darnay, had reason to know the usage. He had seen hundreds pass away so. His bloated jailer, who wore spectacles to read with, glanced over them to assure himself that he had taken his place, and went through the list, making a similar short pause at each name. There were twenty-three names, but only twenty were responded to, for one of the prisoners so summoned had died in jail and been forgotten, and two had already been guillotined and forgotten. The list was read, in the vaulted chamber where Darnay had seen the associated 
treated prisoners on the night of his arrival. Every one of those had perished in the massacre. Every human creature he had since cared for and parted with had died on the scaffold. There were hurried words of farewell and kindness, but the parting was soon over. It was the incident of every day, and the society of La Force were engaged in the preparation of some games of forfeit and a little concert for that evening. They crowded to the grates and shed tears there. But twenty places in the projected entertainments had to be refilled, and the time was at best short to the lock-up hour, when the common rooms and corridors would be delivered over to the great dogs who kept watch there through the night. The prisoners were far from insensible or unfeeling. Their ways arose out of the condition of the time. Similarly, though with a subtle difference, a species of fervour or intoxication, known, without doubt, to have led some persons to brave the guillotine unnecessarily, and to die by it, was not mere boastfulness, but a wild infection of the wildly shaken public mind. In seasons of pestilence, some of us will have a secret attraction to the disease, a terrible passing inclination to die of it. And all of us have like wonders hidden in our breasts, only needing circumstances to evoke them. The passage to the conciergerie was short and dark. The night in its vermin-haunted cells was long and cold. Next day, fifteen prisoners were put to the bar before Charles Darnay's name was called. All the fifteen were condemned, and the trials of the whole occupied an hour and a half. Charles Evremond, called Darnay, was at length arraigned. His judges sat upon the bench in feathered hats, but the rough red cap and tricoloured cockade was the headdress otherwise prevailing. Looking at the jury and the turbulent audience, he might have thought that the usual order of things was reversed, and that the felons were trying the honest men, the lowest, cruelest, and worst populace of a city, never without its quantity of low, cruel, and bad, were the directing spirits of the scene, noisily commenting, applauding, disapproving, anticipating, and precipitating the result without a check. Of the men, the greater part were armed in various ways. Of the women, some wore knives, some daggers, some ate and drank as they looked on, many knitted. Among these last was one, with a spare piece of knitting under her arm as she worked. She was in a front row, by the side of a man whom he had never seen since his arrival at the barrier, but whom he directly remembered as Defarge. He noticed that she once or twice whispered in his ear, and that she seemed to be his wife. But what he most noticed in the two figures was that, although they were posted as close to himself as they could be, they never looked towards him. They seemed to be waiting for something, with a dogged determination, and they looked at the jury, but at nothing else. Under the president sat Dr. Manette in his usual quiet dress. As well as the prisoner could see, he and Mr. Lorry were the only men there unconnected with the tribunal, who wore their usual clothes, and had not assumed the coarse garb of the Carmagnol. Charles Evremond, called Darnay, was accused by the public prosecutor as an emigrant, whose life was forfeit to the Republic, under the decree which banished all emigrants on pain of death. It was nothing that the decree bore date since his return to France. There he was, and there was the decree. He had been taken in France, and his head was demanded. "'Take off his head!' cried the audience. "'An enemy to the Republic!' The President rang his bell to silence those cries, and asked the prisoner whether it was not true that he had lived many years in England. Undoubtedly it was. Was he not an emigrant then? What did he call himself? Not an emigrant, he hoped, within the sense and spirit of the law. Why not, the President desired to know. 
because he had voluntarily relinquished a title that was distasteful to him, and a station that was distasteful to him, and had left his country. He submitted before the word emigrant in the present acceptation by the tribunal was in use, to live by his own industry in England, rather than on the industry of the overladen people of France. What proof had he of this? He handed in the names of two witnesses, Theophile Gabelle and Alexandre Manette. But he had married in England, the President reminded him. True, but not an English woman. A citizeness of France? Yes, by birth. Her name and family? Lucy Manette, only daughter of Dr. Manette, the good physician who sits there. This answer had a happy effect upon the audience. Cries in exaltation of the well-known good physician rent the hall. So capriciously were the people moved that tears immediately rolled down several ferocious countenances which had been glaring at the prisoner a moment before, as if with impatience to pluck him out into the streets and kill him. On these few steps of his dangerous way, Charles Darnay had set his foot, according to Dr. Manette's reiterated instructions. The same cautious counsel directed every step that lay before him, and had prepared every inch of his road. The President asked, why had he returned to France when he did, and not sooner? He had not returned sooner, he replied, simply because he had no means of living in France, save those he had resigned, whereas, in England, he lived by giving instruction in the French language and literature. He had returned when he did, on the pressing and written entreaty of a French citizen, who represented that his life was endangered by his absence. He had come back to save a citizen's life, and to bear his testimony at whatever personal hazard to the truth. Was that criminal in the eyes of the Republic? The populace cried enthusiastically, No! And the President rang his bell to quiet them, which it did not, for they continued to cry, No! until they left off of their own will. The President required the name of that citizen. The accused explained that the citizen was his first witness. He also referred with confidence to the citizen's letter, which had been taken from him at the barrier, but which he did not doubt would be found among the papers then before the President. The doctor had taken care that it should be there, had assured him that it would be there, and at this stage of the proceedings it was produced and read. Citizen Gabelle was called to confirm it, and did so. Citizen Gabelle hinted, with infinite delicacy and politeness, that in the pressure of business imposed on the tribunal by the multitude of enemies of the Republic with which it had to deal, he had been slightly overlooked in his prison of the Abbé, in fact had rather passed out of the tribunal's patriotic remembrance until three days ago when he had been summoned before it, and had been set at liberty on the jurors declaring themselves satisfied that the accusation against him was answered, as to himself, by the surrender of the citizen Evremond, called Darnay. Dr. Manette was next questioned. His high personal popularity and the clearness of his answers made a great impression. But, as he proceeded, as he showed that the accused was his first friend on his release from his long imprisonment, that the accused had remained in England, always faithful and devoted to his daughter and himself in their exile, that, so far from being in favour with the aristocrat government there, he had actually been tried for his life by it, as the foe of England and friend of the United States, as he brought these circumstances into view with the greatest discretion and with the straightforward force of truth and earnestness, the jury and the populace became one. At last, when he appealed by name to Monsieur Lorry, an English gentleman then and there present, who, like himself, had been a witness on that English trial, and could corroborate his account of it, the jury declared that they had heard enough, and that they were ready with their votes if the President were content to receive them. 
at every vote the jurymen voted aloud and individually the populace set up a shout of applause all the voices were in the prisoner's favour and the president declared him free then began one of those extraordinary scenes with which the populace sometimes gratified their fickleness or their better impulses towards generosity and mercy or which they regarded as some set-off against their swollen account of cruel rage no man can decide now to which of these motives such extraordinary scenes were referable it is probable to a blending of all the three with the second predominating no sooner was the acquittal pronounced than tears were shed as freely as blood at another time and such fraternal embraces were bestowed upon the prisoner by as many of both sexes as could rush at him that after his long and unwholesome confinement he was in danger of fainting from exhaustion none the less because he knew very well that the very same people carried by another current would have rushed at him with the very same intensity to rend him to pieces and strew him over the streets his removal to make way for other accused persons who were to be tried rescued him from these caresses for the moment five were to be tried together next as enemies of the republic forasmuch as they had not assisted it by word or deed so quick was the tribunal to compensate itself and the nation for a chance lost that these five came down to him before he left the place condemned to die within twenty-four hours the first of them told him so with the customary prison sign of death a raised finger and they all added in words long live the republic the five had had it is true no audience to lengthen their proceedings for when he and dr manette emerged from the gate there was a great crowd about it in which there seemed to be every face he had seen in court except two for which he looked in vain on his coming out the concourse made at him anew weeping embracing and shouting all by turns and all together until the very tide of the river on the bank of which the mad scene was acted seemed to run mad like the people on the shore they put him into a great chair they had among them and which they had taken either out of the court itself or one of its rooms or passages over the chair they had thrown a red flag and to the back of it they had bound a pike with a red cap on its top in this car of triumph not even the doctor's entreaties could prevent his being carried to his home on men's shoulders with a confused sea of red caps heaving about him and casting up to sight from the stormy deep such wrecks of faces that he more than once misdoubted his mind being in confusion and that he was in the tumbril on his way to the guillotine in wild dreamlike procession embracing whom they met and pointing him out they carried him on reddening the snowy streets with the prevailing republican colour in winding and tramping through them as they had reddened them below the snow with a deeper dye they carried him thus into the courtyard of the building where he lived her father had gone on before to prepare her and when her husband stood upon his feet she dropped insensible in his arms as he held her to his heart and turned her beautiful head between his face and the brawling crowd so that his tears and her lips might come together unseen a few of the people fell to dancing instantly all the rest fell to dancing and the courtyard overflowed with a calm and yawl. then they elevated into the vacant chair a young woman from the crowd to be carried as the goddess of liberty and then swelling and overflowing out into the adjacent streets and along the river's bank and over the bridge the carmignol absorbed them every one and whirled them away after grasping the doctor's hand as he stood victorious and proud before him after grasping the hand of mr lorry who came panting in breathless from his struggle against the water-spout of the carmignol after kissing little lucy who was lifted up to clasp her arms around his neck and after embracing the ever-zealous and faithful pross who lifted her he took his wife in his arms and carried her up to their rooms 
Lucy, my own, I am safe. Oh, dearest Charles, let me thank God for this on my knees, as I have prayed to him. They all reverently bowed their heads and hearts. When she was again in his arms, he said to her, and now speak to your father dearest no other man in all this france could have done what he has done for me she laid her head upon her father's breast as she had laid his poor head on her own breast long long ago he was happy in the return he had made her he was recompensed for his suffering he was proud of his strength you must not be weak my darling he remonstrated don't tremble so i have saved him end of book three chapter six a tale of two cities by charles dickens book the third the track of a storm Chapter Seven: A Knock at the Door. I have saved him. It was not another of the dreams in which he had often come back. He was really there, and yet his wife trembled, and a vague but heavy fear was upon her. All the air round was so thick and dark. The people were so passionately revengeful and fitful. The innocent were so constantly put to death on vague suspicion and black malice. It was so impossible to forget that many as blameless as her husband and as dear to others as he was to her every day shared the fate from which she had been clutched, that her heart could not be as lightened of its load as she felt it ought to be the shadows of the wintry afternoon were beginning to fall and even now the dreadful carts were rolling through the streets her mind pursued them looking for him among the condemned and then she clung closer to his real presence and trembled more her father cheering her showed a compassionate superiority to this woman's weakness which was wonderful to see no garret no shoemaking no one hundred and five north tower now he had accomplished the task he had set himself his promise was redeemed he had saved charles let them all lean upon him their housekeeping was of a very frugal kind not only because that was the safest way of life involving the least offence to the people but because they were not rich and charles throughout his imprisonment had had to pay heavily for his bad food and for his guard and towards the living of the poorer prisoners partly on this account and partly to avoid a domestic spy they kept no servant the citizen and citizeness who acted as porters at the courtyard gate rendered them occasional service and jerry almost wholly transferred to them by mr lorry had become their daily retainer and had his bed there every night it was an ordinance of the republic one and indivisible of liberty equality fraternity or death that on the door of doorpost of every house the name of every inmate must be legibly inscribed in letters of a certain size at a certain convenient height from the ground mr jerry cruncher's name therefore duly embellished the doorpost down below and as the afternoon shadows deepened the owner of that name himself appeared from overlooking a painter whom dr manette had employed to add to the list the name of charles evremond called darnay in the universal fear and distrust that darkened the time all the usual harmless ways of life were changed in the doctor's little household as in very many others the articles of daily consumption that were wanted were purchased every evening in small quantities and at various small shops to avoid attracting notice and to give as little occasion as possible for talk and envy was the general desire for some months past miss pross and mr cruncher had discharged the office of purveyors the former carrying the money the latter the basket every afternoon at about the time when the public lamps were lighted they fared forth on this duty and made and brought home such purchases as were needful 
although miss pross through her long association with a french family might have known as much of their language as of her own if she had had a mind she had no mind in that direction consequently she knew no more of that nonsense as she was pleased to call it than mr cruncher did so her manner of marketing was to plump a noun substantive at the head of a shopkeeper without any introduction in the nature of an article and if it happened not to be the name of the thing she wanted to look round for that thing lay hold of it and hold on by it until the bargain was concluded she always made a bargain for it by holding up as a statement of its just price one finger less than the merchant held up whatever his number might be now mr cruncher said miss pross whose eyes were red with felicity if you are ready i am jerry hoarsely professed himself at miss pross's service he had worn all his rust off long ago but nothing would file his spiky head down there's all manner of things wanted said miss pross and we shall have a precious time of it we want wine among the rest nice toasts these redheads will be drinking wherever we buy it it will be much the same to your knowledge miss i should think retorted jerry whether they drink your health or the old uns who's he said miss pross mr cruncher with some diffidence explained himself as meaning old nicks ha said miss pross it doesn't need an interpreter to explain the meaning of these creatures they have but one and it's midnight murder and mischief hush dear pray pray be cautious cried lucy yes 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 i'll be cautious said miss pross but i may say among ourselves that i do hope there will be no oniony and tobaccoy smotherings in the form of embracings all round going on in the streets now ladybird never you stir from that fire till i come back take care of the dear husband you have recovered and don't move your pretty head from his shoulder as you have it now till you see me again may i ask a question dr manette before i go i think you may take that liberty the doctor answered smiling for gracious sake don't talk about liberty we have quite enough of that said miss pross hush dear again lucy remonstrated well my sweet said miss pross nodding her head emphatically the short and the long of it is that i am a subject of his most gracious majesty king george the third miss pross curtsied at the name and as such my maxim is confound their politics frustrate their knavish tricks on him our hopes we fix god save the king mr cruncher in an excess of loyalty growlingly repeated the words after miss pross like somebody at church i am glad you have so much of the englishman in you though i wish you had never taken that cold in your voice said miss pross approvingly but the question dr manette is there it was the good creature's way to affect to make light of anything that was a great anxiety with them all and to come at it in this chance manner is there any prospect yet of our getting out of this place i fear not yet it would be dangerous for charles yet hey ho hum said miss pross cheerfully repressing a sigh as she glanced at her darling's golden hair in the light of the fire then we must have patience and wait that's all we must hold up our heads and fight low as my brother solomon used to say now mr cruncher don't you move lady bird they went out leaving lucy and her husband her father and the child by a bright fire mr lorry was expected back presently from the banking-house miss pross had lighted the lamp but had put it aside in a corner that they might enjoy the firelight undisturbed little lucy sat by her grandfather with her hands clasped through his arm and he in a tone not rising much above a whisper began to tell her a story of a great and powerful fairy who had opened a prison wall and let out a captive who had once done the fairy a service all was subdued and quiet and lucy was more at ease than she had been 
"'What is that?' she cried all at once. "'My dear,' said her father, stopping in his story, and laying his hand on hers, "'command yourself. What a disordered state you are in! The least thing, nothing startles you. You, your father's daughter!' "'I thought, my father,' said Lucy, excusing herself, with a pale face and in a faltering voice, "'that I heard strange feet upon the stairs.' "'My love, the staircase is as still as death.' As he said the word, a blow was struck upon the door. "'Oh, father, father, what can this be? Hi, child, save him!' "'My child,' said the doctor, rising, and laying his hand upon her shoulder, "'I have saved him. What weakness is this, my dear? Let me go to the door.' He took the lamp in his hand, crossed the two intervening outer rooms, and opened it. A rude clattering of feet over the floor, and four rough men in red caps, armed with sabres and pistols, entered the room. "'The citizen Evremond, called Darnay,' said the first. "'Who seeks him?' answered Darnay. "'I seek him. We seek him. I know you, Evremond. I saw you before the tribunal to-day. You are again the prisoner of the Republic.' The four surrounded him, where he stood with his wife and child clinging to him. "'Tell me how and why am I again a prisoner?' It is enough that you return straight to the conciergerie, and will know to-morrow. You are summoned for to-morrow. Dr. Manette, whom this visitation had so turned into stone, that he stood with the lamp in his hand, as if be woe a statue made to hold it, moved after these words were spoken, put the lamp down, and, confronting the speaker, and taking him not ungently by the loose front of his red woollen shirt, said, "'You know him, you have said. Do you know me?' "'Yes, I know you, citizen doctor.' "'We all know you, citizen doctor,' said the other three. He looked abstractedly from one to another, and said in a lower voice, after a pause, "'Will you answer his question to me, then? How does this happen?' "'Citizen doctor,' said the first, reluctantly, "'he has been denounced to the section of Saint-Antoine. This citizen,' pointing out the second who had entered, "'is from Saint-Antoine.' the citizen here indicated nodded his head and added he is accused by saint antoine of what asked the doctor citizen doctor said the first with his former reluctance ask no more if the republic demands sacrifices from you without doubt you as a good patriot will be happy to make them the republic goes before all the people is supreme evremont we are pressed one word the doctor entreated will you tell me who denounced him it is against rule answered the first but you can ask him of saint antoine here the doctor turned his eyes upon that man who moved uneasily on his feet rubbed his beard a little and at length said well truly it is against rule but he is denounced and gravely by the citizen and citizeness defarge and by one other what other? Do you ask, citizen doctor? Yes. Then, said he of Saint Antoine, with a strange look, you will be answered to-morrow. Now I am dumb. End of Book 3, Chapter 7